must analyze Sonata. Welcome again to Gina Serra's Guitar Sonata Complete Analysis. By now you're probably sick of this face, but as Piazzolla said, the show must go on. Or was it Elvis Presley? As usual, you will find a link to episodes 1 and 2 in the description below and at the very end of this video. Let's go! Canto, which means chant, is the most poetic and introspective movement of the whole sonata. It focuses on phrases and gestures rather than a melodic theme, but I guess you already know this by now. Although it has some tricky sections, it is not as technically demanding as other movements, especially the second or fourth. Here, the challenge will be A. To correctly phrase and bring out all the beautiful and melancholic colors found within Canto, and B. To generate as much contrast as possible between this movement and the preceding and subsequent ones. It is a very well thought piece of music that really fits within the pace of the sonata. Very atmospheric, moody and reflective. As always, I will focus on five topics which are structure or form, technical aspects, harmony and melody, dynamics and rhythmic elements. Salut! I believe, from a humble point of view, the form of this movement is mainly driven by the very opening chord. Throughout this musical chapter you will find such chord utilized as a resting spot. Sometimes it will be arpeggiated, but most of the times it will be rolled. In addition to this very particular chord, the composer also utilizes these big comas, tempo changes and idiomatic gestures. The combination of these elements help the listener have a sonic reference and be able to understand the movement from a holistic point of view. Within the movement I can identify four distinct phrases, to be explained soon. Inside this we can identify sub-phrases that additionally subdivide them, again to be explained soon. I can see each of these is shorter than the preceding one. So the first one will be the longest, the second one will be slightly shorter, the third one will be shorter than the second one, and the fourth one will be the shortest. I can see this movement's form as A, B, followed by a variation of A and a variation of B. For the first A section, I identify this very chord as the main marker. Such chord indicates the return to, what I consider, a mood. However, within the repetition we can find variation. An example of this can be found towards the third page where we can see the return to this chord and a subsequent variation. For the B part, the main marker is this chord progression. Towards the end of the movement we can see the return to this section but with a variation, which in this case is done via the use of a common resource which is a simple transposition of the progression. Nevertheless, the listener will be able to link these sections as the melodic line is identical, but simply transposed a perfect fourth down. I will develop on this later on. The first big phrase I can identify encompasses all of the first page and more than half of the second one. The use of affermata, a phrase coma, and the tempo change clearly indicates that something different will come next. The first phrase is subdivided into three subphrases by these comas. Highlighting them this way will make them more evident. I can see each subphrase is shorter than the preceding one. This means the first one is the longest, the second one is slightly shorter, and the third one is the shortest. It is quite interesting how he does this both within the phrase and the subphrase. Fractals? Hmm. The main character of the first subphrase is this chord. It is usually presented at the beginning of a phrase and then replied to with a rhythmically contrasting figure and tempo. This can be evidenced here, as you can see how these long chords are followed by an accelerating idea that resolves towards that same very chord. 
we can identify how the composer dissects and utilizes as a resource parts of the chord. For instance, look how he subtracts the highest register of the chord, F sharp, and uses it to guide the listener. Sometimes he uses the full trill and sometimes within an appoggiatura. The second time this guide appears, Ginocera returns to the accelerating rhythmic figure, but before doing so, he adds a new idea in between. Towards the end of the first subphrase, he returns one more time to the chord, adds the previously mentioned appoggiaturas, and then slowly develops these ascending harmonics that conclude with an octave jump between these two pitches. The first subphrase is now finished. The second one is more vivid and employs a faster progression of ideas. What I mean here is that there are fewer amount of sustaining long chords and more frequent runs of notes. The space between each of these is almost inexistent. Towards the end of the second subphrase, I can see an improvisatory idea that is repeated with some variation both in the current and third subphrase. The second subphrase ends with a special effect that is also present in the second movement of the entire sonata. This sliding chord towards another indeterminate chord as high as possible on the guitar. Like this. Another apparition of the end of the phrase comma closes the second subphrase. The third subphrase of the first phrase starts with another improvisatory passage, a sort of refrain. There is variation in terms of dynamics and color, but this will be explained later on. This last subphrase ends with the introduction of an idea that will be replicated and shifted towards the end of the movement. The second of the big phrases has a different and contemplative color, as seen in the score. Here we have a melody and accompaniment progression that I will analyze later on. You can clearly differentiate this section from the preceding one and can notice a big change in mood of the movement, especially following this indication, marcato il canto. This means that the performer should really work on emphasizing the melody carried in the higher register of each of these chords. This second big phrase is also subdivided into smaller phrases by either tempo changes, the aforementioned phrasing comas and fermatas. Moving on to the third of the bigger phrases, we can see how he returns to the opening chord, which serves almost as a theme. The beginning is identical, but then develops through the use of repetition. In the first apparition, he simply goes down and up an arpeggio while on the second time he does a little trick. See how Ginastera slowly unfolds the arpeggio by adding notes progressively. If I highlight it this way it will be clearer. The first time we have four notes, the second time four plus two, and on the third time the full passage. This little return to the variation of the A section finishes with the very chord that opened it, but arpeggiated evenly and ending on the trill between F sharp and G. The return to the B section, with an apostrophe, sees the movement reinstate a contemplative and very atmospheric color. At this stage, the composer creates a chord progression that slowly dies and goes down the frequency range towards the bottom end of the guitar. In addition to this, he also creates a slower chordal progression by shifting towards longer rhythmic figures. This generates an overall effect of deceleration that will be counter-stricken with a very contrasting movement, the finale. The attacca indication tells the performer to begin immediately, and that both third and fourth movement should be treated almost as one. To recap this section, the third movement of the sonata, called Canto, is a very contrasting chapter that fits perfectly within the frenzy of the preceding and subsequent episodes. There is no time signature and it is driven by beautiful phrases. We can identify an A, B, A, B form, each having their own very specific characteristics. Each section has a musical marker. These are a chord for the A section and a harmonic progression for the B section. 
The listener will clearly see contrasting material when comparing this. Upon return to these musical ideas, the phrases become shorter and shorter. The overall color of this movement is poetic, rhapsodic and contemplative, a chant to the soul. From a technical point of view, this movement isn't as demanding as others. Yet, one should not underestimate it. I would rate the difficulty as a 3 out of 5. The focus will be on interesting sections, suggest better fingering and also outline challenging passages. To start off, we can see how the composer indicates us performers to let ring the chord. You can see how it is tied to nothing, so it is an indication to let it ring while executing the trill. This is not to be followed to the absolute dot, as we will necessarily have to compromise some of these notes in order to play the trill. I think, from a pragmatic point of view, that the notes you should focus on letting ring are open E and open G. The rest aren't that important. The person in charge of the fingering is very specific about which of the left hand fingers the performer should use. This fingering is circumstantial and might change depending on the development of the music. Sometimes we will use 2 and 3, sometimes 1 and 2, and sometimes 4, 4, 2, 3. I will exemplify this later on. This stemless black dot is the note you are supposed to trill to. So in this case, F sharp to G. And this indication, liberamente, allows the performer to execute freely and within its own pace. This is followed by a common feature found in the sonata, a gradually accelerating motif. There are plenty of examples where this happens, as highlighted only in this first page. Two interesting things to point out from the second system are A the execution of a note plus a natural harmonic, and b, the use of a campanella effect. This happens, generally speaking, when we combine open strings with non-open strings. In this case, we have the highest note of this triad played on the second string, but the open string E will definitely resonate and stand out. It is like some sort of bell effect. It sounds like this. Another thing that bogs my mind is, what does this line here mean? Can you let me know in the comments below? The third system might look daunting and scary, but I think you should just group the phrases, practice them slowly and then try and play them together. Most of the phrasing is already given by the notation, which surely helps. Just listen how the music develops and you'll find natural notes that would resonate more than others, like this D flat or this E natural. The fact that the music changes direction also helps and creates a natural phrase. Moving on to the next page I will focus on two passages. This gives the performer an indication and then allows him or her to interpret freely. So basically we are given a little motif and then we should play it following the score. This indication molte volte means many times. So we should play the motif as many times as we need in order to be able to go from the fingerboard towards the bridge and then back to the fingerboard. The same happens with the second variation of this idea. This technique here was explained in the previous video, but I will explain it again. It simply tells the performer to slide these pitches towards an indeterminate chord, as high as possible on the instrument. I won't explain every system in detail, the only thing I am going to outline in this section is that the performer should try and hold, as much as possible, the note that corresponds to the melodic line. See how the composer adds a little accent on top of each? So it is of paramount importance that the performer really brings out this line while also executing the accompaniment. We can see how the composer does not stay on a single plucking hand position. This means that Ginastera usually looks for different tones and colors by moving the plucking hand between the fingerboard, the natural position 
and the bridge. In the last page there are two things worth mentioning. The first is this accelerating motif that goes up all the way to a 64th note, or hemi demi semi quaver. Jesus! As this piece flows quite freely, the performer shouldn't be too worried about getting the precise exact duration of this note, but rather focusing on starting slow and finishing very, very fast. The last thing to point out, and that I mentioned before, is how this drill is to be executed. So basically, after rolling this chord, we need to use the fourth finger as our link to it. As this chord highest note is executed with the fourth finger, then we slide the pinky up from F sharp to G, and now we can continue using the indicated fingering, two and three, like this. To recap this section, the technical aspects of this piece are not incredibly difficult but shouldn't be underestimated. The composer resorts to a free tempo and feel and also breaks that add interest to the movement, while also introducing accelerating and decelerating musical ideas. He uses contrasting figures in order to create a musical discourse, by interpolating long notes against really short passages. The fingering is articulated in a crafty and well thought manner. Following the indicated fingering is very advisable, but if by any means you find a fingering that better suits your hand shape and bone structure, go for it. I would rate this movement as a 3 out of 5 in terms of technical difficulty. We have already established that this piece does not have a total center. Yet, and specifically to this movement, we can see some chords on harmonic idioms that definitely work as a lighthouse where stranded musical boats will aim their figurehead. The chord I am talking about is the one that opens this very movement. This chord is made up of an idea which is duplicated across the six strings. I'll develop on this by starting on the sixth string. The idea I am talking about encompasses three notes. And if we analyze the relation between these, then we can identify an augmented fourth from E to A sharp and a perfect fourth from A sharp to D sharp. This very idea is repeated, but now starting on the open G string. In this case, we have the notes G to C sharp, augmented fourth, and C sharp to F sharp, perfect fourth. This peculiar amalgam of chords sounds like this. It has both a somber and a beautiful color. We can see how the composer references the previous movements by incorporating already presented chords and concepts. An example of this can clearly be seen in the use of this atonal cluster. You can check more details about this in my previous video, but please see how he uses three adjacent semitones by employing E sharp, F sharp, G. This same principle can be seen towards the end of the third system, but I'll work on that later on. Two more interesting things to point out in this system. First is this chord, or cluster, used here. This very idea appeared on both of the previous movements, so I'll just explain it quickly. This is made of two sets of major sevenths, from a sound point of view. The first major seventh is made of F, E, and the second one is made of B and B flat. We will see more of this later on. The second thing worth pointing out, and that was also previously utilized by the composer, is the transposition of an idea. In this case, we can see how Ginocera picks a figure presented in the first system and simply transposes it in the second and third system. The composer simply transposes this idea up a perfect fifth. So if I consider the lowest note of the run, we can see an A on the first iteration and an E on the second one. You can analyze the rest of the notes on your own. What follows 
shows what a great composer Ginocera was. There's a lot to be extracted from this passage here. From the get-go we can see how he uses the resource of transposition. However, he also adds an extra bit of flavor. Before developing, I can see that he uses an intervallic relation used in the third, the second and the first movement. This is a diminished chord, which is a consecutive succession of minor thirds. So if we take the first note of each of these transposed shapes, we can see an F that falls to a D, first minor third, and then D down to B, second minor third. The next ascending arpeggios feature the use of a tritone, but this might be too stilted. I do agree that he uses this devilish intervallic relation previously discussed, so it is actually quite easy to highlight it here. So I am not too sure about how well thought this was. Anyway, if I highlight them, we can see one here between C sharp and G, a second one here between A and E flat, and the third one between G and D flat. It's funny, because once you are geared towards looking for tritones, you can find them anywhere, but again, I am not too sure that was an evident intention of the composer. Look at this and tell me if you agree. If we take each of these individual notes, can we say we found another iteration of the cluster? We have F, F sharp, G. Am I right? Moving on, we can see a more evident use of this idea of three adjacent notes, which is the same as a chromatic line. Now this can be found in the notes C, C sharp, D. Gina Serra, in most of the cases, applies this idea by not starting on the first note of the cluster, but rather on the second or third. For instance, let's take a brief moment to analyze this in the last system of the first page. Now, look at this very first little phrase. I have the notes B, C and C sharp, if we're looking for a cluster. And then we have another cluster when we take into consideration the central notes D, D sharp, E. What about the next phrase? We have G flat, G, A flat, then A, B flat, B, and then C, C sharp, D. If we move on to the following page, we can see how Ginocera utilizes again the aforementioned concept of the major sevenths. If we take the ascending section of this passage and we subdivide it into three phrases, then we can find the following. First set, F, E, major seventh, B, B flat, or A sharp, major seventh. Second set, D flat, C, major seventh, G, F sharp major 7th. Third set, A, G sharp, major 7th, D sharp, D, major 7th. However, this could also be analyzed as a transposition of an intervallic progression. This would be an augmented 4th, F to B, followed by a perfect 4th, B to E, and then a diminished 5th, E to B flat. This can be simplified as tritone plus perfect 4th, plus Triton. Now, this is another way of looking at this passage. You can pick the one you think is best in terms of composition. Or maybe he tried to combine both intentionally? Moving on, we can see this is replied with a series of more stable intervals. Before analyzing them, I can only mention that if we take the first note of each group, we can see the composer uses an interval of minor sixths. So we have F to D flat, minor six, and then D flat to A, another minor sixth. This is another thing Ginocera is usually fond of, transposing an idea following a predefined interval pattern, such as minor sixth or perfect fourth. Examples like this can be found in previous movements. Continuing with the more stable section of this passage, the composer contrasts the major sevenths with sets of perfect fourths and fifths. We have E down to B, perfect fourth, B, G, minor third, G down to D, perfect fourth, D down to A, perfect fourth, A down to D, perfect fifth, and then D down to A, perfect fourth. Yet, as Ginocera is very bold, he goes back to the employment of major sevenths. We have G flat F, major seventh, C, B, major seventh, E, D sharp, major seventh. 
these are found within the triplet figure. And then we can see B flat A major 7th and also A flat G major 7th. These two last figures have an added note in between the interval. These are D, D flat, another major 7th. I know, super duper overly researched. Let's consider the next passage. I'm going to pause the video so you can analyze each note and let me know what idea the composer returns to. Ding 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 ding! Clusters! In this case, double clusters. Look, E sharp, F sharp, G, and the second cluster is F sharp, G, A flat. Still dead! We have arrived to a new section within the piece different in color, tone and tempo. This is going to be interesting. I will analyze the first phrase because there is a lot going on here. First off, let's consider the melody found within the highest voice. B down to A, then down to G and finally F. I'll pause the video and ask you, what interval is formed between F and B? You know it, baby, it's right on time! Now let's analyze the inner middle voice. E, E flat, D, D flat. What do we have here? A descending chromatic line or maybe a double cluster? I don't think so. For me, it's just a simple descending chromatic line. Now let's take the bass line C down to B flat, down to A flat, and G flat. What interval is formed between G flat and C? Yep, you guessed, another tritone. So we can see Ginasser employs descending tritones in the outer voices while contrasting with a chromatic descending line in the inner voice. Now, what is the relation between the outer voices? C to B. That is a major seventh, an interval explained just moments ago. If we play each line individually, this is how it sounds. If we play them all together, this is how it sounds. This passage resolves onto what I consider a double chord. The first chord is quite evident D flat, F, A flat, or D flat major. The second one requires a bit of imagination and I am going to say E major. How did I arrive to this conclusion? Well, I know that E major is made up of E, G sharp, B. So what I do is I simply use the enharmonic equivalent of A flat, which is G sharp. And chin chin, I have an E major. It seems like A flat or G sharp is used as a common ground between these two chords. What do you think? In the next passage, I will focus mainly in the melodic line. Before doing so, we can see the composer uses a common resource such as melody and accompaniment. In the first part of the passage, the melody falls, while in the second part, it rises. Also, as well as following an opposite direction, the composer shifts the register to a lower octave. Rewinding to the first passage, we can see a descending line that goes B, A, G, F, E. This is the very same melodic line presented moments ago. Look. However, he now chose to change the underlying chords that serve as accompaniment. As explained before, this melodic line is made up of a tritone that resolves towards E. Now let's analyze the second passage. Now you may ask, how do you know this is a different passage within the same phrase? Well, First, you can see the register of the melodic line changed an octave lower. 
Then we can see both a tempo change and also a dynamic indication. All of these characteristics gives us the idea that the piece is going elsewhere very soon. So the second passage starts on F and simply goes up in full tones following the tritone interval. So we have F, G, A, B. He simply loves his tritones. Now let's look at what he does towards the end of the system. I can see he disguised this tritone in a very subtle manner. There is not an evident and clear melodic line as before, but let's analyze the highest note of each of these musical intentions and we'll see the same melodic line he just used. We have F plus G plus A as an appoggiatura and B. See it? Arriving to the last page, we can see the composer develops a series of descending and ascending ideas that conclude on a very stable E with two extra octaves added. This serves as a resolutive point that is further emphasized with the tempo change indication. There is a new, short little section clearly defined by an end of phrase coma. In this section, the composer uses mostly a melodic line reinforced with either one or two octaves down. The first time we can see a double octave leap, while the second time there is a single octave difference. He repeats an idea that consists of a chord followed by a descending melodic line. This line goes D, C, B flat, A, E. The second time he uses a different yet familiar chord, D flat major, and the same melodic line, but this time with a little twist. Now we have D, C, B flat, A, E. However, there are a couple of things worth pointing out. First, there is only a one octave difference rather than two. Second, the last three notes of this melodic line are harmonized differently. And third, he uses the note E from the following section to complete the melodic line explained before. Also, I can see he uses this same E as a pivot and as a part of a new melodic line that goes E, D, C, B. I see it as a link between both phrases. The employment of the fermata, combined with a perfect fifth interval, creates a big stable moment within this page. This is a point where the performer can rest, take a little break and wait before moving on. The next passage is quite interesting as it combines, in my eyes, consonance and dissonance, but it is hidden in a subtle manner. Initially, we can see that Ginastera takes this perfect interval of E and A and simply utilizes it as the underlying harmony. I am not considering this B natural because it is simply a tie from the fermata. However, the pattern E plus E plus A repeats religiously throughout the entire passage. This is the consonant element of the passage. Now let's move to the dissonant section. This is found in the highest note of each set of grouped notes. Let me explain. We can clearly see how he adds a note to the arpeggio each time the set repeats. The first time the composer goes up the pattern and adds an A. Then he goes down. The second time he goes up the pattern, adds the A of the preceding set and continues going up to, in this case, D. Then he goes down. The third time, following the sequence, he goes up the pattern, adds the preceding D and A and adds this G sharp then he goes down. However, on the fourth time, he repeats this principle but skips a G-sharp and simply adds a C-sharp to the pattern. In the last iteration of this idea, he goes up the pattern, plays all the notes added so far and keeps on going to F-sharp. He utilizes this F-sharp as a pivot point to return to the opening chord of the movement. He then jumps down an octave and plays that remarkable opening chord. Now, before moving on, I want to emphasize something. Actually, I want you to discover something he did beautifully. I want you to pause the video for 5 seconds, analyze the highest note of each grouping, which I just highlighted in green, and tell me why did he choose such notes. For the ones who were able to figure it out, congratulations. For the ones who want to find out, we can see these four notes were played 
as a chord in the previous system here A, D, G sharp, C sharp He used the same chord both to open and close this section of the movement the return to the opening color of this movement has some interesting variations. We can see how Ginesera decides to apply this idea of adding notes gradually. This time, we can see he takes the gradually accelerating arpeggios of the very first opening system and constructs it by adding notes in each repetition. The first time he only plays four notes of the descending arpeggio. The second time he adds another two notes and the last time he simply plays it as found originally. Towards the end of the system I can find two interesting things. The first is a transposition of a tonal cluster found early in the piece. I am referring to a cluster made up of E sharp, F sharp, G. This very cluster appears in the second system of canto, but appears in a different sequence and an octave higher. So it would be some sort of imitation and transposition, because it is not the exact same. The first time he wrote E sharp, G, F sharp, while the second time he inked G, E sharp, F sharp. The second, stilted, item I find interesting is the use of this sextuplet grouping of notes that feature, to my understanding, two of these so-called clusters. This required a bit of inventiveness, so bear with me. The first one is quite easy to find, and the second one will be evident as soon as the former is explained. So, the very first cluster is made up of D sharp E F, and by subtraction the second one will be G A flat A. The second one is a bit more difficult to hear, as the notes are not adjacent, but split by the former cluster. However, if we only take into consideration the notes of the split up cluster, then we see a descending line going. A, A flat, G. Smooth criminal! The last system really creates a beautiful and alluring sensation within the listener. The diminution of the tempo, combined with the reiteration of a transposed passage, closed the movement beautifully. This passage appeared before, but starting on B, rather than F sharp. The relation of the notes is exactly the same, but down a perfect fourth. However, the last resoluted chord is different. Ginesera chose to resolve onto the open string of the guitar. In this case, 5th, 4th, 3rd, 2nd. The very last chord progression combines chords and open strings. Most of these chords already appeared before, sometimes identically and sometimes with slight variations. For instance, the first chord can be found in the second page, here. The subsequent chord can be seen early in this page, but found as an arpeggio. The second last chord can be seen also earlier in this page, here. And the very closing chord is found almost identically towards the middle of the second page. They are almost identical, but with a variation of a G to a G sharp. Synthesizing this section, we can see Ginastera does not have a specific tonal center, but rather chords that serve as sonic beacons. Throughout the entire sonata, we can see he uses resources such as atonal clusters, predefined intervals, tritones, and more. Canto, the third movement, is full of beautifully combined dissonance and consonance. Another resource the composer is fond of is the employment of double chords a great way to create stability and dissonance simultaneously. The harmonic language and idioms found within this movement create a rich and wholesome music complexions of ethereal and contemplative character. I can say the dynamics are probably the most important and fundamental thing when undertaking this movement. This is because canto is less demanding from a technical point of view, so the appropriate contrast brought forth by the correct emphasis of the dynamics will definitely enhance the overall listener experience. As a fundamental rule within music, whenever we have a repetition of an idea, we must change something. This rule is usually met by changing dynamics or hand position, among other resources. 
This is very clear in the first bar. Same idea, different dynamics and different hand position. So we have mezzo forte plus natural hand position followed by piano and ponticello. A simple yet effective resource to prevent the listener to anticipate to what comes next. I am not going to explain everything exhaustively and step by step, but I feel this movement is made up of musical phrases that work in perfect synergy. As mentioned in the form section, I see this movement as having an A, B, variant of A and variant of B structure. Following this idea, I can see the A sections are more diverse and contrasting, while the B sections revolve around a short spectrum of dynamics, in this case either mezzo piano or piano. See how the first A section has a wider array of dynamic contrast. We can see Ginastera jumps only in the space of two systems, from mezzo forte to piano and then back to mezzo forte. This is followed by a forte chord which is immediately counterstroke by a soft piano phrase before going back to forte. This variation and randomness creates richness and expectation that will be contrasted later on. It is interesting to see how the very opening chord is never repeated with the same dynamic marking. In the four times it appears in the first page, all intentions are different. Towards the end of the first page, we can see how the composer creates dynamic tension. See how the phrase begins quite softly and slowly builds up. We go from piano to mezzo forte, then to forte and to double forte. And then it is immediately shadowed with a completely opposite double piano. I like very much how this repetition of an atonal cluster goes from double piano to forte and back to double piano. This is reinforced with instructions to shift the plucking hand from the fingerboard through the natural position towards the bridge and then back but repeating the same process in an opposite direction. This sounds kind of like this. Moving on to the B section, the music evidences a remarkable change in tone, mood and color. I reckon this is the most beautiful section of the entire movement. This contemplativo indication is really precise and correctly reflects the intentions of the composer. This is an ethereal and beautiful passage that sounds this way. As mentioned earlier, all this B section focuses on a contemplative tone, and the chant, seen first in the high register and then in the middle, really adds beauty to this section. The return to the variation of the A section is abrupt and sudden. See how the composer carries a piano marking from the previous system and suddenly jumps to a mezzo forte while also changing the rhythmic figure towards short bursts of notes. The second iteration of what I consider the A section is, again, full of spiking dynamics that encompass the spectrum of sonic possibilities of the guitar almost completely. Within the repertoire of the classical guitar, pieces where the performer is required to play anything beyond double forte or double piano is seldom seen. It does happen in this piece though, but I can't recall off the top of my head any other work with a triple piano or triple forte dynamic marking. Maybe you can suggest some in the comments below. See how in the space of a couple of systems we have plenty of dynamic variation. As mentioned previously, this A section is characterized for having abrupt changes. These are further enhanced with variations in tone and color as the performer is instructed to shift its hand across different positions. Towards the end of the movement, the composer returns to the B section. The melancholic and ethereal aspects really flourish upon repetition of this musical idea. This time the original idea is transposed a perfect port down. The color changes and now the guitar is playing within its more commonly used register. The tonal balance is precise and allows the music to slowly extinguish while giving birth to the very energetic fourth and final move. One could say the dynamics are probably one of the most important aspects of this movement. 
They are erratic and random for section A and steady and calm for section B. The spectrum covered in canto goes from double piano to double forte, the most commonly found within the guitar repertoire. The character and mood of the third movement of this fantastic guitar sonata is full of rich colors, ethereal tones, melancholic melodies and contemplative harmonies. A very introspective and alluring musical chapter by Alberto Ginostera. Lucky both for me and you, HA! This movement ain't as rhythmically challenging as numbers 2 and 4. We already established this chapter is more about expression and phrasing rather than technicality and virtuosity. As a departing point, I would say the performer shouldn't be extremely worried about adhering strictly to the rhythmic values. I see them as referential, not literal. The lack of time signature and indication, liberamente, really emphasize the importance of a non-robotic performance. The tempo should be taken as a guide, but it must not be followed metronomically. For instance, even though initially we have four minims, they simply indicate the development of little stops which are then followed by a contrasting shorter rhythmic value. If we take the very first system and add a crotchet to subdivide it, then this is what we get. However, one should not practice this with a metronome while following a strict pulse. The performer must know the piece is melancholic and slowly paced. At the beginning of the system, we have the introduction of a rhythmic pattern that will be repeated sporadically throughout the piece. This is an idea that goes against the pace of the movement, as it involves an equation of two very short notes followed by a proportionally substantial longer value. I hear it as a little burst of music, and it really generates a contrast in the listener, especially when played in context and when being compared to the preceding and subsequent minims. This sounds like this. Another characteristic worth mentioning within the second system is the operation of a triplet. This is important because it's the very first iteration of a value that is not within the binary rhythm system. Moving on, I feel the following passage looks way more difficult to read than it actually is. I would have definitely subdivided these two phrases in order to make them more legible, and also to help the phrasing, but that is just me. Before continuing, you might be wondering what does this mean? 12, semicolon, 8, or 22, semicolon, 16? Well, this means that the performer should play the left value within the space of the right value. Look, the first one can be simplified as two sextuplets. Additionally, the fact that the music changes direction really helps the ear understand this phrase as two sextuplets. It sounds like this. The second one is a bit more complex, but fear not, we shall unwind it together. Rather than confusing the performer with an ugly number such as 22, I would definitely have subdivided it this way. First, a set of 12 notes subphrased into three sets of four notes. As you can see, the direction of the music is downward. Then, when the music changes direction upward, Simply subdivide it again into a set of 10 notes, which are also subphrased into two sets of three plus an additional set of four. So now, instead of a 22 over 16, we have a 12 plus 10. I think it is simply easier to understand it this way. Towards the end of the first page, there are two things I'd like to focus on. The first is the apparition of the aforementioned rhythmic idea. Here, the composer uses the same rhythmic values, but transposed. The intervallic relation between the notes is the same. The other thing I'd like to focus on is the first phrase of the very last system. I see this as an imitation of the idea I just explained. We can see a quick burst of notes followed by a proportionally substantial longer value. If we analyze this from a mathematical point of view, the composer asks the performer to play five notes in the space of a quaver which is quite fast, and then immediately contrast this with a single quaver. 
The following phrases present us another opportunity where it is advisable to subdivide the phrase in order to understand it better. This time we have 14 over 8 and also 19 over 16, but I leave that up to you. Remember that the musical direction is a parameter that could guide us and help to identify better subphrases. I'd like to point out how the composer creates a slowdown effect by elongating the rhythmic value employed, gradually going from shorter towards longer values. By the time we reach the middle of the second page, the movement shifts its color and the composer resorts to a common technique such as melody and accompaniment. Within the quintuplets, the melody is differentiated from the accompaniment via the employment of different voices. The stems pointing upwards represent the melody, and the stems pointing downwards represent the accompaniment. A great way of correctly spacing the notes within a quintuplet is by simply spelling the word hypopotamus. You can find more about this in my previous video. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. The melody is detached so that the performer is actively conscious about letting it ring as much as possible. We can see the composer generates tension by shortening the rhythmic figure from a quintuplet towards a sextuplet. I would suggest practicing the transition between these figures slowly and focused, as the listener should be able to correctly notice a change in the values of the notes. Such passage culminates in a peak of rhythmic tension when the composer resorts to bursts of semi-demic quavers, an evident allusion to a rhythmic idea explained before. As we reach the third page, I want to further emphasize how the composer works with different voices so that the performer is aware of how they should be treated. This passage has almost an identical rhythmic pattern, except on the last beats. See how he uses a downward beam to accentuate the idea of a chord that resonates while a melody develops. The slight variation of the last beats add character and prevents the listener from anticipating to the music. Continuing, we have another instance where Gina Serra creates rhythmic tension by shortening the value of the notes by going from quaver to sextuplets to semi-quavers to sextuplet semi-quavers and resolving onto the original minimum idea. It is interesting to see how, on the reiteration of this accelerating passage, he changes the rhythmic value employed. While he originally sped up to demi-semi-quaver value, or 32nd note, on the return he speeds up to a hemi-demi-semi-quaver value, or 64th note. The rest of the systems don't feature any new rhythmic value, but one interesting thing the composer does to close the movement is an elongation of notes. Such technique allows him to slowly fade the music towards a very calm and soothing tone before the rampage of the last movement kicks in. This indication here, Ataka, tells the performer to join both movements, almost as if played as one. As a recap to this section, I can say the rhythmic elements found within this movement are of moderate difficulty and easily surmountable. There is no identifiable and steady pulse and this chapter is mainly composed of phrases and idioms rooted in a free nature. Therefore, there is no need for a time signature. Special attention needs to be paid to the correct subdivision of polyrhythms. This will guide the performer and help him or her better understand the underlying motion of the music. This movement is mainly written within a binary rhythm system, with seldom apparitions of ternary-oriented sets of notes. This generates contrast that help keep the listener engaged throughout. The composer often resorts to contrasting long rhythmic values against short bursts of sets of notes, sometimes gradually and sometimes suddenly. As a movement wrap-up, we can say this is clearly the most poetic and expressive of all the four musical episodes that comprise Ginastera's only guitar sonata. The difficulty of this movement would be of an intermediate to lower advanced level. It has a contemplative and dreamy character and it will challenge the performer not from a technical but rather from an interpretation point of view. Canto works great within the context of the entire sonata, as it breaks the frenzy of movements 2 and 4, and really captivates the listener with alluring harmonies and tantalizing melodies. The character is somber yet beautiful, melancholic yet entangling, and reflective yet familiar. As always, I'm super grateful you made it this far. If you want to learn more about movements 1 and 2, you can check them out here. And if you want to subscribe to my channel, you can do it here. 
Thanks again and have a great day.